Our first keynote speaker of the day is Elizabeth Agro, who is formerly at the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh, where, uh, where since 1996, she served as a curatorial assistant, assistant curator, and associate curator in the, de in the decorative arts department. In 2006, she was appointed to the position of Nancy M. McNeil, Associate Curator of American Modern and Contemporary Crafts and Decorative Arts at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Ms. Agro joined the museum in support of the acquisition, exhibition, research, and publication of American decorative arts from 1850 to the present with an emphasis on contemporary crafts. Elizabeth and I connected when she was first working on my entry for the museum's book, Volume 1 of American Silver, Makers A through F. It is currently at press and there are four volumes planned. Highlights among her wide-ranging exhibitions and installations include Wrought and Crafted Jewelry and Metalwork, 1900 to the Present, Lino Taglia Petra, Paintings in Glass, Calder, Jewelry, and Craft Spoken Here. Agro is the co-founder and advisor of Critical Craft Forum since 2009. Critical Craft Forum offers real-time conversations about critical issues of interest to the field. It is a place for makers, curators, theorists, historians, collectors, writers, and critics to explore and discuss research, exhibitions, ideas, and publications that span the terrain of craft. The project that is currently consuming her attention but has captured her imagination is a major comprehensive survey of contemporary Korean art planned for spring of 2021. As a curator of crafts, she is very committed to perpetuating the field. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Agro. Thank you, Kathy, for that beautiful, warm welcome. I'm thrilled to kick off this afternoon's proceedings, and I want to thank ThinkCraft and the Cleveland Institute of Art, and especially Matthew Holleran, for inviting me to participate. A special thanks should go to the KLF Visiting Artists and Scholars Program. Without those endowed funds, these things cannot happen. This is the most uh, I have to say, an exceptional symposium, um, so well planned, so put together, and so thoughtful and paced. Um, usually we cram things in into like a two-day, you know, extravaganza, and your head is spinning. And I at first thought, this is very slow, but in a way, it's been extremely wonderful to take pause between each session. I'm honored to also be part of this August group of artists and scholars presenting to you today over the past three days, excuse me. I'm charged to deliver a lecture that shares with you my perspectives and experience of being a craft curator. And so let's get started. For the most part, I'm going to be scripted. I will go off script uh, at certain points in time and at the end sort of really elaborate on certain things. So the, the title of my talk, talk is Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, Galleries. Um, <laughs> name, my 12-year-old uh, helped me with that title. And she said, Mom, you are, that's what you do. You guard the galleries. And so in a way, like the galaxy in the movie, I am that guardian. Um, but also pinching from uh, Star Wars, a focused reality, and that's what I'd like to discuss with you today. I've come to you today straight from the trenches of the Philadelphia Museum of Art to give you the lowdown and my perspective on the nature and state of curating in a large, world-renowned art institution. And here's a slide of what used to be our auditorium. Um, we are currently in our second phase of our Frank Gehry renovation which is not an external plan, it's an internal one. The museum has never uh, had a renovation since it was completed in, I think, 42, 44. Um, so this is a major moment in, in our museum uh, uh, building structure, what we will be presenting to the public in the future. Uh, and I'm going to start my talk discussing how contemporary craft was integral to PMA's founding mission the impact of the museum establishing a key and high visi highly visible curatorial position to focus on this field and using public facing projects um, as examples to discuss my essential work that occurs behind the scenes which is changing the very essence of my institution 
the, the position that craft will hold in art historical canon decades from now. Founded in 1876 as the Pennsylvania Museum and School of Industrial Art, it differentiated itself from other fledgling American art institutions in Hartford, Boston, Chicago, and New York by assembling a collection of decorative arts. Influenced by the 1876 Centennial Exposition, the first international exhibition to be held in the United States, the museum formed its initial collection with objects directly purchased from the exposition, modeling itself after the Victorian Albert Museum in London, England, renowned for housing the finest examples of ceramics, glass, wood, metalwork. The PMA focused upon exceptional examples of decorative arts made by hand or machine, both historical and contemporary. Under the direction of curator Edwin Atley Barber, hired by the museum in 1892, the collection was strengthened with objects of all media acquired directly from the world's fairs and manufacturers. Like the Victoria and Albert Museum and its School of Design, the museum and the School of Industrial Art intended to use collections pedagogically to improve instruction of applied arts and, in effect, inform, taste, and advance the manufacture of American industrial art. So on the slide here, you'll see the various courses that they offered. These are engravings of what the school looked like. They even had a forge, uh, which is pretty amazing. Commencing in 1919 and completed in 1928, we moved from Fairmont Park into our building on the parkway. A contemporary at the time of the building's completion commented on it as, the wonderful Greek garage. In 1945, Fisk Kimball, the museum's director, took note that the collections were lacking representation of 20th century decorative arts. And although the Board of Trustees showed little interest in the applied arts, isolated gifts of contemporary craft and design, such as Swedish glass and hand-wrought pewter vases, were sporadically acquired. That same year, the museum purchased four works of art made by the renowned ceramicists Gertrude and Otto Natzler, supported by funds from Mrs. Herbert Cameron Morris, an avid supporter of the museum and a member of the museum committee. So this plate uh, is a really, for me, it's one of my favorite objects in the collection, and it's one of the greatest things to start with when talking about the, the collection at PMA. Um, you know, it's about uh, 12 inches in diameter. It has this incredibly delicious almost lickable ornamental glaze. And on the back of it is the, is the surprise. It's signed G plus O Natzler. You don't find that very often. Usually it just says Natzler in that wonderful black ink um, that he's signing. And it's dated 1941. Um, they arrived to the States, you know, pretty much a year or two before this plate was made. And the fact that the museum was purchasing it, purchasing it, not giving it give, or gifting, for, in 45, that the movement that we so call American studio craft hadn't even officially kicked off or wasn't even codified. And here our museum had the understanding and the appreciation for an object such as this. And I think for me, it's foundational. Um, these objects were the first examples of American studio craft to enter the museum's holdings and are foundational to our collections of modern contemporary craft. The formation of the Inter Society for 20th Century Decorative Arts and Design, now known as CoLab at the museum in 1970, a volunteer group dedicated to supporting the museum's decorative art and design collections, furthered the growth of craft collection by supporting acquisitions of artwork from regional artists. And um, here is another example. This was a, a purchase as well. Um, it w as you can see, it was purchased with CoLab funds, um, but also the Women's Committee craft show committee kicked in funds as well. Um, it was purchased in 76. Um, this is one of the last objects Olaf Skooksford made. Um, he died after doing his last crit at UArts. He came home, kissed his wife on the forehead, took off his boots, and then passed away. And so he you know, was really taken in the middle of his career. We, we, we only have drawings to suggest what was to come in the next season over the Christmas holidays. He would always make his next body of work. Um, and the fact that the museum not only would honor uh, this man's legacy and to acquire this important object, um, it, it, at a moment where, again, the, the collections were, there was no curator of craft. There, was no, there were decorative arts departments meshed within the museum, but no one was focusing on, focusing on this work full time. Um, so this was a really exceptional example of the museum actively pursuing this thing called craft. The effort was then strengthened in 1977 when the Women's Committee of Philadelphia Museum of Art launched its annual craft show, the first of its kind 
as a fundraiser for the museum. And here you see an image from that first craft show in 77. Uh, Joan Mondale came to, to cut the ribbon. Uh, she was instrumental in bringing craft into the White House collection. Um, and she made sure, they made sure they got her here at Philadelphia to be there at that very important moment. By 1981, the Women's Committee dedicated a percentage of its craft show proceedings for the acquisition of contemporary craft, which was unusual. The museum does not have, like, they have dedicated funds, but imagine just to have one singular fund line that this position, or, or at that time, just to buy things from the field. Uh, by, um, this pursued the museum to acquire steadily in all craft media over four decades, and this continues today. In 1989, the museum acquired an entire wood-paneled library and music room designed by Warren Neshrick for the Curtis and, from the Curtis and Nellie Lee Bach House in Gulf Mills, Pennsylvania. Designed in 35 and executed from 36 to 38, this purchase, largely funded through the generosity of W.B. Stroud, represents the largest example of American modern craft acquired by the museum to date. Celebrated as an American icon in woodworking, this 20th century period room is considered to be Eshrick's masterpiece. It serves as a, a dual purpose as marking the chronological beginning of the museum's collection of American studio craft. Furthering the advancement of this field in the 21st century, Robert L. McNeil, Jr., a trustee and chair of the American Art Department Committee, made a transformational gift in 2003 to endow the first curatorship in the United States dedicated to this field. This position was named for Nancy M. McNeil, his wife and co-founder of the museum's craft show, who was also a longtime member of the American Art Committee and donor of craft to the collection. Appointed in 2006 by director Anne Darnancourt, the museum's first Nancy M. McNeil Curator American, of American Modern and Contemporary Crafts and Decorative Arts, the longest title that exists at the museum. <laughs> For the shortest person you've ever met, I was charged to engage colleagues across departments initiate a dialogue about craft in an international context. This mission was fostered in an ener energetic exchange and discourse among my colleagues, growth in acquisitions, increase in installations, and in the museum's gallery and special exhibitions focusing on craft in a global context. The first week on the job, Darning Court schooled me on what was to be my curatorial priority. It was her wish that I enmesh myself within the craft community, regionally, nationally, internationally. And she was very firm about that. That was the, her priority for me. She even called out my first assignment, which I was grateful for because at the time, you know, craft wasn't something we all studied in graduate school. It was not a subject. I'm a decorative art historian by training. And so even though I knew about what was going on out there, to have you know, and a directive and, and an assignment was a good thing to start in this new position in a very exciting and most important museum in this country. Um, the assignment was four years down the ro road. It was the 2010 Philadelphia and Sika conference, and she was very explicit. She had felt that she had done and Sika wrong. And in, I guess, the previous decade, they had come to town, and we had done nothing. There was no one on board to do anything, nor did they know how to manage that. Um, and so she wanted to make amends. It was very important. The result of this directive was interactions in clay, contemporary explorations of the co collection. Um, and if she had lived to see it, I think she would, have, she would have said, you could have done something, but that was a little crazy. This was a, a huge assignment. Um, I selected four artists out of 20 that were being positioned in um, institutions around the city. I chose Walter McConnell, Paul Saccharides, Anne Agee, and the late Betty Woodman to create site-specific work influenced by historic collections and period rooms. And let me, I'll just click through quickly. So we, were, we allowed the artists once chosen to go through the museum and select a part of the museum that they could respond to. Um, so Walter McConnell chose our Indian Temple Hall, and uh, it's called Calling Earth to Witness, and it, it looked like this. Um, this was wet clay that he formed. He had preformed a lot of the uh, more decorative pieces, the more uh, detailed pieces, but we had to have, like, I think, a, 
it felt like a ton of clay, come and sit in the gallery. We covered everything in plastic, and he built this sort of biodome around it. It had its own weather system, a cli- climate system, and it would rain in there at times. Um, it, it was really ethereal and, and beautiful and very well beloved by our, our public. Paul Saccharides chose our Pennsylvania German collections, and you can see uh, his work behind the glass with these collections, and here he is installing them. That work was called Towards Models, Propositions, and Some Possible Systems. Anne Agee was very enthralled by our Milbach Kitchen, which is a Pennsylvania German uh, kitchen from 1752, and also very much inspired by our uh, Robert Adams Lansdowne room. And she conflated the two into that kitchen by making wallpaper and creating ceramic work. So colliding two worlds that represent her childhood, that of a wealthy family from her mother's side and that of an extremely poor family on her father's side. And she was told that there was no difference between these spheres. And so this bisection has always been in her thinking. Another close-up. Also, the Robert Adams Room inspired Betty Woodman, who chose uh, her work to be called Lansdowne Room Revisited in Lunette. And she's drawing direct inspiration to create this installation in a gallery that was nearby. This, um, th- this opportunity and experience was in- incredible, because I don't think any major museum at that time to date at, at that date, I should say, um, had ever allowed artists to run free through their collections. The Met, and the Bro- Brooklyn did something, I think, a few years later, but we were the first to sort of, at least on the East Coast that I can think of, that allowed this sort of interplay. Um, you know, where Kraft didn't really have a, a permanent gallery. Here we are, fan, you know, skipping freely through period rooms and, and permanent galleries. Um, and this mammoth project involves skills of diplomacy, negotiation, bribery within the museum, with Ensica, the artists, and self-flagellation on my part. It was extremely difficult, but well worth it. And while engaging the curatorial conservation installation design departments, I broke a ton of rules by dusting off some very old held ideas and ideals held by our very own provincial museum. It was well worth it, and I think it allowed me to move the agenda one step forward. In 2008, Darnicourt unexpectedly passed away, and so she did not see what she had intended me to do um, with Ensica. Um, But her charge to connect to craft, to the craft community, made me double down my efforts to reach beyond Philadelphia. It was sort of my tribute to her. Um, You know, because it it was so, it was such a a tremendous loss at the museum. It was a new era also in the sense that social media was exploding. And with my partner in crime from the West Coast, my colleague Namita Wiggers, we co-founded Critical Craft Forum, an online platform for, on Facebook for dialogue and exchange, as you heard earlier from Kathy, um, for makers, curators, theorists, historians. We, we, you, you took my text, Kathy. <laughs> um, and and it basically, to, to span the terrain of craft. And Critical Craft took off, beginning with just under 200 members. Uh, we launched in 2009 using Facebook as our platform, and now we're 11,312 strong. Across, representing every corner of the world. Uh, there's, there are so many partners out there on Facebook through this, this wonderful platform. As we gained momentum, we added sessions at CAA and are proud to have ways for our community at large to connect both virtually and academically. And you know, this was a, a wonderful opportunity because when I got this job and was on the job for two years, the only place that we could all meet and talk to each other in terms of whether you were a curator, um, even a maker, or um, whether you were freelance or affiliated, were academic as well, were, was the marketplace. It was always SOFA, SOFA New York, SOFA Chicago, um, ACC, and all these things are important and, and have served our craft community. But with the idea of money being exchanged in the background, we're meeting in like the hallway with a fast snippet of conversation, or what are you working on, or trying to get together. But it wasn't working, and I didn't like the fact that we were in a marketplace all the time, that there was no pause and calm conversation. Not that Facebook or Critical Craft can be calm. Sometimes it's not. It's blowing up. 
But it, it, we needed some dialogue. And, and for me, having been a decorative arts curator as long as I have been, um, craft offered a different opportunity. Um, and social media offers an, the alternative, you know, it offers another alternative opportunity as well. It's so democratic. And for me, I thought it was important, since you all had taught me coming into this field, the community that we have. I mean, we, when I meet an artist, maybe the first thing is, how are you? How are you doing? How is your family? It's very personal. We are a community. It, um, I always surprise my colleagues in contemporary art about how I engage with artists and the questions I ask and how personal it gets. And, and sometimes maybe it's a little too close for comfort for you and for me, but it's really wonderful. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And we needed to, to have that in a way that wasn't market bound, marketplace bound. Um, and so I think Critical Craft Forum was born out of that necessity. Um, and I, I just wanted to share that background with you. My intensity, commitment, and, uh, and boundless energy in this newly created position galvanized the museum to rethink craft's position and place in its hallowed halls. Taken with my vigor and the museum's desire to privilege craft, Le uh, Leonard and Norma Chlorfine followed McNeil's lead by establishing the Leonard and Norma Chlorfine Foundation Endowed Fund for Modern and Contemporary Craft in two th uh, 2008 a dedicated fund which supports programs, research, exhibitions, and pivotal works of art by leading artists in the field. And it allows me to really do just about anything. It's not bound to one thing. It's not just a name on a wall. It's, it's an idea. It's, it's work. It's travel. It's any sort of thing I want it to be, which is incredible freedom for a curator to have that kind of access to funds. Over the past 12 years, the collection has grown exponentially, and I've used those funds to make that happen. Um, in fact, the collection has doubled um, and continues to flourish at a steady pace. For the most part, the mantra I employ for my curatorial practice is the object is primary, and everything I think about and practice do, uh, that, about my practice, derives foundationally um, as, for the construct of object-based work. The liquidity provided by the craft show and the Chlorfine Fund helped me redefine my collection plan and strategically strike in acquiring significant work. It didn't take me long to realize that I should be in the business of collecting contemporary masterpieces, those that could rival our Renoirs and Zans and aspire to equate to Duchamp and Brancusi. And so here's a selection of works that I'm most proud to have acquired thus far in my time at PMA. They are mileposts for the collection, objects that can hold their own alongside and in company of the art made in their time, but also connect and have continued conversations to artwork that are centuries old. Rebecca Medell's The One. This was her masterpiece. She won the, a prize at the uh, Lausanne Biennale uh, for this very work in 85. Um, she taught at Tyler for several decades. To not acquire this work would have been a shame, and it, it was held on, the artist held on to it for many years, and I was very lucky that it was shown at Fiber Philadelphia in 2008, and I was able, through um, the kindness of Snyderman Gallery, to pace my payments so that I could acquire this work. Wayland Gregory's Earth. This, this um, work is by this, maybe he's known from this area, he started his career in Cleveland, um, but he is an unsung hero of ceramics. Um, he created, um, he worked for Cowan Potteries for many years, and then he moved to the East uh, Coast. He worked for Perth Amboy um, Ceramic Factory, making very large-scale work. He learned the business of making large work. He learned how to fire them in large industrial kilns. Then he built his home in Warren, New Jersey, and then he dug clay from his own backyard. He also built his own nine-foot kiln on his property. And he was, he was so celebrated in the mid-30s that... Um, for the 39 World's Fair, he was asked to do two programs at the fair. One was for the Ford Company, and it was a very much in taste of the time, a very um, streamlined uh, sculptural program with, you know, very nice lines and sleek curves of, about the car, you know, automobile industry. But he was also given the freedom to do one more um, fountain program, and it was celebrating the atomic age. And... In the center of this uh, wonderful and very over-sexualized fountain, I might add, he had the four elements, earth, fire, water, and air. 
Um, and here is Earth, and she is about eight and a half feet high. She weighs two tons, um, and you can see Gregory's fingers all over this object. He didn't pour this object. He didn't model it through casts or such. He hand molded this work. He used clay that he didn't know what the clay body was. Like I said, he dug it up in his backyard. He created a system in which to hang all this clay, an armature, sort of you know, figuring it out on, on his own and, and firing it with the risk that it could explode in his kiln. He created these four works and, and they were celebrated at the fair and then they languished on his property for many years. This came to auction in 2010 and the minute that I saw it in the Rego auction catalog, um, I knew we had to have this work of art because for me, it talks about the moment where design and industry give over to craft and handmade things. Um, this was a work that wasn't, the funds were not put up by industry. This was what he wanted to make and he had his own vision in making it and he had his own way and his own say using industrial practice to inform how he could make it. And what it does is it, it signals and hearkens large ceramic sculpture that's to come after World War II. It allows John Mason, it allows Toshiko Takeizu, it allows any other given artist that I can't think of at this very second to make large scale ceramic sculpture. It, it gives way and gives birth. And so to me, it's a, it's, it's a mile post in that story as well. Michael Peterson's Coastal Stack, a wonderful, uh, coming out of the center for, for, for coming out of the uh, wood turning world, um, this one sculpt, wonderful sculptural work um, that is just so beautiful. Sheila Hicks, Wow Bush. This object sat in our basement in 25 boxes, deposited there by, Con um, by Mildred Constantine to rescue it from Sheila herself, who likes to keep trimming and cutting and trimming and cutting until there's nothing left. It was placed in the museum, um, I would say in the late 70s, early 80s. So it sat for 25 years until I came and said, why is this sitting in the basement? And I guess we just didn't know who really owned it and what the rules were around it. And so Sheila Hicks was having her very important exhibition, ICA. And um, she wanted to do a lecture at the museum. And I said, I have a better idea. You can do your lecture, yeah, but, but you have to play my way. And she asked, what do you have in mind? I said, we're going to build the wow bush on stage. And she's like, what? How are we going to do that? I said, like Willy Wonka's golden tickets, we're going to place tickets in the audience. And we're going to ask everyone to go under their seat. And if they had a ticket, they were part of the procession to build the bush from the back of the room to the stage so that we could actually see what it was that we might acquire and gain momentum behind it and, and get acceptance that this belonged with us. Um, you know, there are only a few of these sort of um, performative works that she has. And for the fact that this was languishing and not accession and unknown was really ridiculous in my estimation. And so we acquired it shortly a few weeks later and it was a lot of fun. Rudy Staffel, a ceramic artist, but made four chalices in Rome when he started the Rome program through Tyler. Really important to have a work like that. And then there were younger artists, Doug Bucci. Um, who, whose work is continuing that wonderful conversation between technology in the hand and jewelry, bringing it into the 21st century. Um, this is one of the first um, works in the collection that, that deal with those technologies in CAD CAM. This is my pride and joy. This work of art came to me through uh, private means, not on, not on the public marketplace. Um, and you know, it's very rare to come to have an opportunity to purchase a work at a very pivotal moment in the most important ceramic artist from the 20th century, Peter Volkus. Um, I really truly believe that this work was fired in the same firing as the rocking pot at the Renwick. Um, you know, Glenn Adamson, who's here, who did the exhibition on Volkus, you know, can, would agree. I mean, it's, it allows us to look at Volkus in a whole new way. Uh, we, we see that where he's been as a painter, if you notice the big loops of, of, of uh, of a uh, slip painted on the surface, a very abstraction, the abstraction and gestural drawing. We see um, the rocking pot and, and we see also um, the idea of his future stacks and his, his cuts and slashes into his 
future platters. This is looking backwards, it's looking in the moment of what he, where he was and what he wanted to do, and he's also looking forward in what he's going to do. So for me, this was a really important work of art. Another unsung hero, and in the backyard of, of Philadelphia, Joel Philip Myers, one of the last objects he made as part of the Dr. Zarkov series. These walked off the street as a gift. Would you like these two Bertoia brooches? I said, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Really wonderful. <laughs> Anders Ruhl. This was purchased at Design Miami. And this, was, this caught the eye of my director, who said, go see this work. We want it. And that was a thrilling moment. My director gets it. It's really nice. Bernard Bernstein's Havdalah set. You know, first of all, an important metalsmith who studied with, with um, uh, Walpert at the, at the Jewish Museum Silver Shop, Silver Shop Workshop. This is the first piece of Judaica to enter the Museum of Arts collection. I'm just gonna say, leave that there. Emma Milan, really important wood sculptor from mid-century, totally forgotten. And Roberto Lugo, all about the Benjamins. This is a self-portrait on the other side, is a picture of himself, uh, just opposed to Ben Franklin, and it's about Philadelphia. How can we not have one of his most important bodies of work from, you know, and this man's going to make more great things, but this was a moment and an important moment to capitalize on. So making up for missed opportunities and acquiring uh, things in the moment um, were, is an important part of what I'm doing as a curator at PMA. So lured, lured away from the Cleveland Museum of Art, Timothy Rubb became our new director after Ann Darnacourt had, and we lost Ann Darnacourt in 2008. And so he ushered in a new age at the PMA and with it, inclusivity of art, which found itself on the fringes, of out, uh, on the fringes or outside the canon. My collections were suddenly not to be relegated to hallways and byways of the main building. And a gap in the schedule produced an opportunity, craft spoken here, the first major exhibition of craft was mounted at the museum in 2012 and marked an important milestone in the development of the museum's engagement with this art form, its artists, donors, and collectors. And it's important to also say that this opportunity um, had a lot of pressure. You know, the gap w was supposed to be filled by something else and then nine months out they realized that, that it, they didn't have it together and they said, Elizabeth, you need to pull, can you pull this together? And nine months in my world is not a lot of time. Um, I used our collections. I did not borrow at all, which adds, you need more time for that. There was no publication. There was nothing to market in, in time in terms of having some piece of something in perpetuity. But it, you had to just pivot and run with it. And, and that's what I did in creating this exhibition. And so I tried to, to show things that were never shown properly in the past because they were on a terrible hallway. I was, I was able to hang this Lonatani work um, in a way that you were meant to be seeing it. And when I proposed this show to the executive, uh, you know, executive offices, I told them that basically the museum had lost its nimbility and we had lost the ability to take risks. And that what I was going to do, not to say that craft was a risk in this gallery, they had already agreed that the show had to happen, but what I was going to do with it and how I was going to position it for this museum would seem risky. And the reaction of when I went through my s checklist through slides for that meeting, one of our colleagues said to me, wait a minute, wait a minute, I thought this show was about craft. This is sculpture. And I said, oh, really? And I just continued and didn't really respond. <laughs> but it, it, again, it allowed me to, to um, to cross uh, departments, lines, and borrow from my colleagues who had been collecting actively over the past few years um, and make um, a statement about exploring universality and connectivity in craft, uh, an exhibit from all over the world, and show all its diversity of media and scale. And as you can see, I mean, it, I feel like I laid it out really well. It wasn't crowded. It allowed you to really experience these works of art. The, ex the exhibition and the craft lab, which was an accompanying educational community-based 
program within the exhibition. This was not downstairs, it was not in the lobby. Um, it was purpose on my part. Um, and we also, uh, you can see, like, it, it was an opportunity for people to come together and make. Um, and there was nothing that was fl flammable or wet clay. It was like crocheting, any kind of handwork opportunity. Um, it became intergenerational. Uh, the retired ladies who were trying to get away from the heat th that July and a lot of millennials who were still looking for work m would come to this space. They would separate themselves on this couch, but by an hour would go by and they would sh start sharing how they were making, what are you doing? How do you do that stitch? And then they would plan to meet up the next week. People were staying in this space for five hours at a time. That's unheard of in our world. Um, and people were happy. <laughs> we also yarn bombed the front entrance of our building, which reinforced um, that craft was critical to the museum's charge. And um, that was really a lot of fun as well. Craft Spoken here paved the way for a series of five iterations entitled At the Center, Masters of American Craft, which drew heavily upon the American Craft Collection, but it also allowed me to borrow from uh, various artists in the community. The most important thing about it, though, was that I wasn't in the hallway anymore. I finally was in our American art galleries, which gave prominence and equity to this thing that, that wasn't, well, I mean, respected maybe before. And I think it sent a very important message. For me, I felt like as if I had secretly set, sent a, a cannonball across mainstream art's bow. Like the fact that we were finally in the matrix of this, main, of this mainstream museum. And as you can see, like I tried to, I think it got better as I went along each year. Um, I try, in this case, I paired artists, like in this case, Tom, uh, Ted Holman and Robert Winokur, Rudy Staffel and David Ellsworth, sort of interesting pairings. The last one just closed. Um, we had Yvonne Bobowitz and Sharon Church and Jack Laramore. To further distinguish itself as a leader of a vibrant international uh, craft initiative, I created Techne, Ambassadors for um, Craft at the Museum, and it's an affinity group of collectors and enthusiasts who share a mutual passion for ceramics, glass fiber, and wood from around the world. Drawn from departments of American art, contemporary art, costume and textiles, East Asian, European decorative arts, South Asian art, the dynamic programming stimulates dialogue and exchange of ideas through shared experiences drawing on museums' exper expertise, outstanding collection, and connections of the broad spectrum of artists that exist. And here's a, a wonderful slide from last week. We visited Judith Sachter's uh, studio. To this end, the men, the museum continues to strive towards ensuring a continued strength, vitality, and prominence of craft within our galleries uh, in Philadelphia regionally and also nationally, internationally. This overview provides you with a foundational understanding of how PMA privileges craft, but I'd like to dive in a little bit more and speak more earnestly to you addressing my position and what I believe to be critical work. For the past decade, I've consciously not engaged in the tiresome and Sisyphusian question that plagues our practitioners, is craft art. The very need for and creation of this position says it all. I distanced myself from this futile debate early on, and so it began with me to shift the conversation in the very actions of my daily practice. Reiterating that the object is primary to museum work, I focus on how I position the collection in most everything I do. I, on how I write, speak, install, and think about it. This connects to two aspects of my work that I'm deeply committed to. The first one is typecast as a rote and somewhat onerous task. The classification of artwork. How any object is cataloged and its classification will determine how it is found online it, in any given search or any, by any single person, and therefore it is perceived and considered in the future of art history. Cataloging an object is similar to metadata. And th this is a great slide, which I think kind of says it all. Metadata um, you know, is the, the tagging of, of data so that you understand where it came from, what it is. Um, it, it's just identifiers, if you will. And there's a wonderful quote that came with this image. You know, metadata, you see, is a real 
is really a love note. It might be to yourself, or in the fact it's a love note to the person after you, or the machine after you, whether you've saved something that, where you've saved something that amount, that amount of time to find something to, by telling them what the thing is. It's truly a love letter to the future, as it says. I love this field, and I'm committed to its long and prosperous future. And in order um, to have that future, we need to properly catalog extant work by important makers who gave birth to this field and those who continue to align themselves through the, their current output. It is imperative to assign these classifications and feed this data to the machine. I liken it to the Ancestry.com's 23andMe moment we are in. We need to and should be excited to do this work. The slide that you see here is an art his history timeline from 1900 to 2010 and as with assigned canonical classifications which are used by most as search terms to find examples of a variety of artwork. It is a chart for our genealogy and craft needs to be tethered canonically to this art historical mothership. Like metadata, the data will live on with the object, like DNA. It will establish connections we cannot even fathom. This does not take away the unique and special way we speak, write, and talk about craft, and I plan not to abandon that at all. It permits, um, it only adds more to what we have to say. It permits others who are not familiar with our field to gain access, thereby including us in the mainstream conversation. And I'll show you an example. This is a mother well in our collection. I love this painting. It is really, really beautiful. And it's really important. When I acquired the Volcus, I immediately thought about the mother well. I th it just linked up somehow. How could it not? They're kind of made in the same moment. They're of the same energy. Um, and even though Peter Volkus, you know, called the rocking pot a pot, he is an abstract expressionist. We've talked about that in the show that happened not too long ago. But somehow these things aren't tethered together. But they should be. And, they, and it's not that we're making this up. It makes a lot of sense. So when you look back and forth, you can think about these things. They belong together. And as I said earlier, when I acquired this, my intention, maybe not right now, maybe I cannot do this now. This is the cement I'm laying down every day. The intention is that this will be in the gallery with the mother well. I'm planning for the future. And by tagging these things in that way, by classifying that and doing this very dry and boring work, it allows someone else, 30 years from now, when the Met does that iconic show on abstract expressionism, our pot will come up along with the mother well. Here's a wonderful Clifford Still that was on loan to the museum. I hope it comes back to the museum. And, you know, I, I make my walk through the galleries every few weeks just to see what's new, you know, let things inspire me, try to draw connections. And I, this, this painting just kept, kept at me. Couldn't figure out why. And then I realized why. Because it's the two-dimensional version of R. Thomas Stern's night image number one that he made in 63 upon coming back from his experience in Venice. You know, night image is, um, is his memory of what dusk was like in Venice, his first day ever in Venice. He arrived at dusk and he looked across the lagoon and the shadows and light that he saw, he tried to recreate in this three-dimensional work. And if you go back and forth, it's like, it's light, it's shadows, it's, it's, but this is in fiber, and the other is in, in, on a canvas. And, but can you imagine these works together? Can you imagine all four of these works in the gallery when talking about abstract expressionism? Oops. I, will, um, I will also add that I recognize that we are in an age where the blur is celebrated. We are hailing artists who are also considered crossover, and we should. I also respect self-designation, but, but it is imperative that we define and classify these artworks. And in doing so, we understand what we are blending, where we came from, 
and where we are going, more importantly. We lose nothing and have so much to gain by doing this work. The marketplace, as I see it from my perch, is the other hot topic that I'd like to address. It is the gorilla in the room, or really that tsunami we've been unwilling to discuss. That is, collectors, gallerists, auction houses, and curators don't want to have this conversation, or are unwilling, or maybe are fearful. The wave, or maybe more like it waves, are the multitude of craft collections in private hands. Newsflash, there is no plan in most cases. Your children, for the most part, don't want these objects. And 99% of the artwork is undocumented, unpublished. There are no catalog resumes. Or for the most part, there is a lack of general scholarship for many of these artists who are our icons. The first waves have already hit our shores. The estate of Candace B. Groot from April of 2016, you know, she passed away. Children didn't know, maybe they knew, but they lived with these things, but did they know each individual artist that was in this very large, important collection of ceramics? Treadway Toomey did the best job they could. Things sold under estimate, things sold for not even close to what they, were, what they paid for. And what happens? The, the, these things are now scattered. God only knows where some of them, if they didn't sell, were bought in where they are. Um, artists' values are plummeting in the process. It's, it's really a, a terrible moment. Um, and, it's, and for a curator who's also, you know, the reason why my collection is doubling is not just because of my purchasing. It's because the offer of gift, which is how we, museums thrive. We need this. We love this. But it's, it is tremendous. I would say a large part of my daily work is trying to figure out what I'm being offered, where it stands in this artist's career with really nothing to put my fingers on. There's only one catalog resume that exists for Wendell Castle. God bless that person who did that catalog. Um, this is important work, right? So I'm just concerned, and I thought I would bring it up. I don't have answers. I just think there's a need for a conversation and honesty. Um, I would say that Again, like I said, a lot of my day is spent on this work. I was, I'll tell you one story. Uh, um, some work was literally dropped off at the museum. Um, it was a, a place setting for eight flatware. Um, we're not going to ex accession eight settings. Uh, no museum does that. Um, the, the donor said, you either take it, take it all or let's send it to auction. I knew if it went to auction, you know, this is an artist that's still in the marketplace, it would be terrible for that artist. Um, so I hatched a plan. I said, if I can find three other institutions that would take two sets, two play settings each, would you consider like, me splitting it? And the, the donor has agreed in theory. So that's, I spent eight months trying to find three other institutions that would take because, you know, no one's answering their email over the summer. <laughs> but, um, and so what I've done is not only will this two places come to our institution, now this artist will be in three new museums that they weren't in before. Um, there has to be a better way of doing this work. Um, and we have to be sort of super aware that this is happening. And there has to be lots of conversation because we all are culpable between collectors the auction houses, the academics, and the curators, this is a conversation that needs to take place. In my daily work as a craft curator in a globally significant art museum, I make inroads in very public and unseen ways. I liken it to a rock thrown in a still lake, resulting in those gentle ripples that radiate beyond my gaze. Craft today, although driven from a different impulse and impetus, is prominent due to the confluence of a, of a myriad of eclectic artists from around the world, coupled by the energies from academia, the commercial world, and public institutions. This is my ma mantra. You know, always remember, your focus determines your reality. And I've been doing that since taking this position in 2006. I'm not accepting the reality that was handed to me. I'm focusing on the reality that I want it to be and planning for that day 
that I may never see beyond my curatorial lifetime. Craft, um, as a guardian of the galleries for our field, I am playing my role in this craft economy. The question that I will leave with you today is how, how are you? How are you participating? And what are you giving? I'll just say thank you. And I'm done. <laughs>